Hello everyone and welcome to the Melbourne Traditionalist Podcast episode 51. My name is Mark Moncrief from Upon Hope and today I have a few things that I want to start off with. So I'm going to start with those little things first and then uh, get to the main topic. Now the first thing is I have to issue a correction. Um, In the Deep State episode I said that the United States Army had never gone under 500,000 since World War II, and its current strength is 460,000. So that's a mistake. So I hope you can all forgive me. Uh, secondly, I have a article that I wanted to, uh, to talk about, and that is on Breitbart, uh, issued on 11th of J- July, 2020, by Matthew Boyle. And it's Mike Pence on Supreme Court. Maybe no issue more important to the life of the nation than the destiny of SCOTUS, which is Supreme Court of the United States. So let me read from, uh, from this. There may be no issue more important to the life of the nation than the destiny of the Supreme Court, Pence said. As we learnt in the recent disappointing decision on the right to life, I hear conservatives around the country understand now more than ever that we need four more years of President Donald Trump in the White House. We're confirmed more than 200 judges to our federal courts, and that includes two justices to the Supreme Court, and I can tell you that each and every one of them are exactly the kind of conservative jurists that President Trump promised to appoint in the election of 2016. In recent weeks, uh, retirement rumours have circulated regarding Conservative Justices Clarence Thomas and Samuel Alito. Concerns about the health of Supreme Court Chief Justice John Roberts have also been made public. Then questions about the health of Liberal Justices Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Stephen Breyer, both in their 80s now, linger as well. Breyer is 81 now and will be 82 by election day. Ginsburg is 87 years old now and will be 88 early next year. That means the next president could appoint as many as five or perhaps even more justices to the Supreme Court in the next term, a level of impact on the country not seen in generations. Then there's a a tweet by uh, Donald Trump from the 19th of June 2020. I will be releasing a new list of conservative Supreme Court justice nominees, which may include some or many of those already on the list by September 1, 2020. If given the opportunity, I will only choose from this list, as in the past, a conservative Supreme Court justice. Then the article goes on. Presumptive Democrat presidential nominee, former Vice President Joe Biden, meanwhile, has said in recent weeks he will not release a list of names from which he will pledge to nominate justices to the Supreme Court. One thing I hesitate to do is follow anything the president does at all because he usually does it all wrong, Biden said at his first press conference in months a couple of weeks ago. I have. We are putting together a list of a group of African-American women who are qualified and have the experience to be on the court. I am not going to release that until we go further down the line of vetting them as well. Asked about Biden's refusal to publicly release his list of justice candidates, Pence said he is not surprised Biden is not being transparent, but that Americans do not need a list of names from Biden to know he would appoint radical leftists to the Supreme Court. Well, it's a very interesting article because uh, recently we've had some very strange outcomes from the US Supreme Court, um, giving away a big chunk of Oklahoma to an Indian tribe um, and not really being very conservative at all. But I guess at the same time, we've gone so far in one direction, it's probably too much to expect that we're going to go a long way in the opposite direction in a short time. So you know, Donald Trump's re-election, I guess, is really important on this. It is one thing that he has absolutely had his eye on, and he has appointed a lot of judges. And, you know, there has been some good successes in uh, in some lower cases. 
you know, I mean, there's so many going on, it's hard to uh, to actually identify exactly whether it's good or bad. But, you know, when you look at the Supreme Court, it's it's, it's very mixed and it would be get better to uh, to be getting some more people on the right. You know, at the, the top of this photo, there's uh, the nine Supreme Court justices. There's uh, five white men, three women, one one of which is Jewish, one's white, one's Hispanic, and one black man. And the black man is Clarence Thomas. And I tell you, the court would be better if there were nine of him. You know, he's probably the most conservative of the whole bunch. And pretty regularly too. Whereas the others, uh, they slip and slide like slippery, slimy things. But uh, when I read that, I just thought, hey, it's, it's an important thing to keep in mind um, when we're talking about should Trump be re-elected? And of course, the other issue is, um, you know, Trump isn't Hillary. That's a big plus in his favor. Um, and he's also not Biden. Um, yeah, you know, creepy Joe. Yeah, I hope not. Um, I also had a, a message from, let me find it, sorry, uh, on the, um, the Deep State episode from Keen Eye Joe. Hello, Joe. Hope you're doing well. Um, but it's a shame your thought train was interrupted by the good news of your friend's wedding, where you were discussing how effective the left is at unifying their different factions and were leading to a thought about how the right might do the same. But unfortunately, you never got that far. I went back and, and listened to the episode and, uh, and I realized you were right. I was building to a, uh, to a point. And really, the point is about mutual support. You know, the left always makes sure that they look after each other. And each position that they hold, whether it's uh, in academia or the media or uh, in politics, whatever position they hold, they can reinforce the other positions. So, you know, the judiciary says, oh, we have to do this because this academic report says that, that this is what we require. And the parliament, you know, the politicians can do the same. And then the courts can say, oh, we have to do this because the, 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 the politicians have said so. And then the academics can say, oh, we have to do this because the courts have said so, and so forth and so on. So they're all mutually supporting. They all look after each other. And we on the right have to do exactly that. We have to prov provide mutual supporting positions. And it's been a topic that I've been meaning to write on for ages. I think probably years, and I haven't actually done it. Uh, I always get uh, distracted by some other other um, idea. But I really need to talk to write more on this and uh, and elaborate this point. But just briefly. That, that's really what we need to do, to do exactly what the left does. Always make sure that you've got interlocking support. And that's, that's something that we're really missing. Now, um, today, I want to talk about something that has, I, I find really distasteful. Um, and it's something that just keeps coming up. And it came up, it, it's come up a lot since the XYZ conference. And I was asked about it during the XYZ conference. And uh, that is this German love, the love of Germany and particularly the love of Nazi Germany. And, uh, you know, I was specifically asked at the conference, uh, what do you think of, of Churchill and his treatment of Germany? And I said, I approve, and, which I do. Um, and I absolutely don't share this this love of Germany. I don't hate Germany, but I, in a war between us and them, I'm on my side. I'm not on their side. And a lot of people seem to not have that opinion on the right. They seem to have this fascination, this fixation. And uh, it, it nearly always leads into, um, oh, the Holocaust never happened. And I just... I just don't have any time for this idea. I just really, really, it disgusts me. It absolutely disgusts me. And uh, I, it makes me, it disgusts me so much that it makes me wonder if I'm even on the correct side of politics. You know, it is, are these the people that I have to hang around with to actually get things done? 
and um, and sometimes I, I really do find that a bit too much. But what I want to talk about is why I don't support Germany in the two world wars. You know how the world wars were for a lot to a large extent Germany's fault. If Germany had made different decisions, then there wouldn't have been wars. But Germany made decisions because it wanted war. And that's something that people on our side often uh, ignore, and they shouldn't, because they should be on their own people's side, not on a foreign people's side. And the primary reason that so many people aren't on their own people's side is because they're they know a lot about ideology, about belief, about ideas and ideals, but they don't actually know that much history. And uh, I encourage everybody to read history. You know, once you have read history, then you get a much better idea of what's going on and, and what's real. Because this is a problem when you talk about ideology, and it doesn't matter whether it's left, right, whatever, you're coming from a particular standpoint and you're accepting the prejudices of that standpoint and everything has prejudices and history teaches you that everything has prejudices and that's perfectly normal but you have to accept that that's true you can't accept you can't think that hey i'm an exception to that everyone else is biased but i'm not and that's what i find a lot in these discussions that uh, because they have a particular belief, then another country that shared those beliefs is right. Well, that's not true. Now, let's go to World War I. In 1919, at the Treaty of Versailles, the Allied nations, primarily France and Britain, had Germany basically at gunpoint signed the Treaty of Versailles. Germany was completely defeated, it was over a barrel, it had to sign. And one clause in particular it greatly resented, and it told the Allies it resented it, and they were like, no, you've got to sign it. And that was the clause about war guilt. And the Allies said that the entire war was Germany's fault. Germany had started the war, and it bore sole responsibility for what had happened. And Germany was a bit like, hey, you know, things were a bit more complicated. And the British and French said, no, they weren't. And actually, all of them had a point. But after 1919, as tempers cooled, remember the war only finished the year before, as tempers cooled, people went, hey, maybe we were a bit harsh on, on Germany. Maybe, you know, things were more complex maybe the German argument was, was right. Not, not to say that they're completely absolved of guilt, but you know maybe they're 100% is too much. And that became the mainstream view until 1964. And in 1964, a German historian uh, wrote a book where he'd gone through the archives and he basically said, no, the, the, the Allies were right in 1919. Germany was 100% responsible for the war. And in uh, a lot of uh, books now, you'll see that again. Now, obviously, people are a bit, um, they find that a little bit hard to accept that Germany is 100%. Actually, I agree. I, I find it very hard to accept as well. But let's have a look at how the First World War started and the big difference between the First World War and the Second World War is that the First World War came like a bolt of lightning. No one expected a war to break out in 1914. And in fact, most of the senior generals, the war broke out in summer, most of the senior generals were on holiday. That's how unlikely people thought war was. In World War II, everyone saw it coming for years and years. And uh, it was sort of like the red pill, you know, the more and more people were taking it all the time until eventually everyone went, hey, we're really at war. But in 1914, as I said, it was, it was a shock. And it all started with the assassination of the Archduke Ferdinand in Sarajevo. 
Now, he was assassinated by men from a group called the Black Hand, who were Serbian nationalists. And uh, in 1908, there had been a revolution in Serbia, and the royal family had been murdered, and a new royal family had taken its place. And the reason was because of the Black Hand. The Black Hand basically said, hey, we want a greater Serbia. We want Serbia to occupy all of those places where Serbs live. And that includes in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And the old king, the one who was murdered, said, no, that's ridiculous. We can't fight against, against, the, Ottoman, against um, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. They're just way too strong. And the new king, who also didn't want a war, but also realized that the only reason he was king was because he'd helped murder his, uh, his successors, or his um, predecessors. While he didn't know about the attack on the Archduke, he did know that the Black Hand was plotting, that the Black Hand was active in carrying out uh, and planning for acts of terrorism. So when the Archduke was murdered and the Austro-Hungarians went, hey, you can't kill the heir to the throne and not have any, any consequences because the people who had many or most of the people who were involved with the plot were captured at the scene of the assassination. So it wasn't a, a secret what had happened and who had paid for it and who had organized it and who had trained them. So here we have this purely Balkan war potential war and Austro-Hungary puts this pressure onto Serbia and says hey we want you to basically give up your national sovereignty because you've got to be punished and actually most of Europe agreed with that but there was one country that did not agree and that country was Russia and Austro-Hungary knew that Russia was not keen on Serbia being punished because they were both Serb, I suppose they were both Slavs, so they both wanted, they want, they both believed in a, a greater pan-Serbian, uh, pan, I keep saying Serbian, apologies, Slav, pan-Slavic um, identity. And the Germans, who were also worried about the Russians, gave the famous blank check to Austro-Hungary. Now, basically, their idea was. We will give 100% support to Austro-Hungary, even up to and including war. But it shouldn't come to that. Right? Russia should back down and Serbia should get its comeuppance and everything goes back to normal. But what happened was it was summertime. Not only were the generals on leave, but in Austro-Hungary, they had developed a tradition of sending much of the army home on leave so that they could bring in the harvest so that the country wouldn't, wouldn't go hungry. So, you know, hundreds of thousands of men went home on leave and, uh, and brought in the harvest and then came back. So that's why there was the delay in the assass between the assassination and actually going to war. And Germany's like, well, you know, what are you, what are you doing? And in most history books, the idea is that you know Austro-Hungary is is an old, decrepit empire, just like their emperor, and you know they just can't, they're just not a functional organization, and it's just complete nonsense. There was a practical reason why the war didn't start when it started, but once Austro-Hungary got its act together, brought all its men. Back, back into the army, it then deployed them to Serbia and it went to war and it attacked Serbia, it invaded Serbia and Serbia beat them, Serbia pushed them back. While this is happening, Russia mobilizes. Now there was an idea in 1914, a ridiculous idea I think, but one that most people believed and that was mobilization means war. So once you call up your reservists, then you have to go to war. It's an inevitable, it's, it's like a conveyor belt. Once you're on the conveyor belt, you're gonna end up at the end of the conveyor belt. But of course, human decisions are not conveyor belts. And Russia mobilized and did not go to war. 
But what that mobilization did was it then turned a purely Balkan war and what may have been a purely East European war into a world war. And the reason that it turned into a world war is Germany. Because Germany had a plan. It had a timetable to fight a war. And it had exactly one plan and one timetable. So if there was a separate set of circumstances, Germany would bring put into play its one plan. And its one plan was that it would simultaneously go to war against France and Russia. And there was no other option. And something like 90% of its army would be sent to France to knock France out of the war in the first three or four months. And then to turn that army around and put them on trains and ship them all over to Russia and then crush Russia. That was the one plan. France wasn't involved in this Balkans conflict. It didn't have any issue with Austro-Hungary. No, no serious issues anyway. There was no reason for France and the Austro-Hungarian Empire to go to war. France went to war because Germany invaded it. In fact, Germany invaded Luxembourg, tiny little Luxembourg, a few hundred thousand people. And in a bizarre move, it invaded, then realized that it hadn't actually issued a declaration of war. Its soldiers withdrew from Luxembourg. And then the next day, when the declaration of war was actually proclaimed, walked back in and took over Luxembourg. So Luxembourg was invaded twice in two days. But the big thing was Belgium. Belgium is a country that was created when the Reformation took place. The Netherlands to the north is predominantly Catholic. Belgium, uh, correction, is predominantly Protestant. Belgium is predominantly Catholic. So the people in Belgium did not rebel against their Spanish rulers. They were ruled by the Habsburgs, who controlled both Spain and Austria at that time. But the Netherlands did, and the Netherlands fought in what's called the 80-year war to become an independent country. And Belgium did not. And then afterwards, Belgium became known as the Austrian Netherlands. And that's what it was up until 1815. And it had been occupied by Napoleon during the Napoleonic Wars. And then in uh, 1815, it became part of the Netherlands. And all of what is now Belgium was part of the Netherlands. And then in 1830, there was a revolution in Belgium. And they said, no, we want to be, we want to be free. We want to be our own country. So they did. They became their own country. The Netherlands gave them up pretty peacefully. And because it was such a strategic piece of land, it was actually given, given an international guarantee. And three nations guaranteed its independence. Britain, France, and what was then Prussia. And they all said that they would keep Belgium as a neutral country. No one would use Belgium to their advantage. And when France and Prussia and the other German states went to war in the Franco-Prussian War in 1870, everyone stayed out of Belgium. And Prussia and the other German states defeated France in France. But in 1914, that's not what happened. In 1914, the Germans advanced into Belgium and said, you have to give us passage. And the Belgian government says, no. So they invaded Belgium. And they occupied Belgium. Actually, they were, they were pretty brutal in Belgium. They, they shot something like 80,000 Belgians during World War I. You know, conscripted hundreds of thousands of them as forced laborers, including sending them to Germany. Um, so for the Western Allies, it was Germany's fault. There was no reason for them to be dragged in to this Balkan conflict. 
but Germany insisted that they had to be. And Germany came very close to winning in, uh, in 1914, to defeating France. So why did Britain come into the war? Well, that's a little bit more controversial because in 1914, Britain had a, late, a liberal government. And I mean liberal in every sense of that word. So the liberal, it was called the liberal government and it was the liberal party, what traditionally were known as the Whigs. And they were very popular in the period from 1908 to 1915. They were the government of Britain. They were the first ones to bring in a lot of social welfare programs. That was the beginning of the British welfare state. And... uh, And they created something that they shouldn't have created. They created the Cordial Entente, which was a secret alliance between Britain and France. Now, Britain wasn't supposed to have any international alliances with anybody. But in 1904, they actually signed this this Cordial, which means agreement, between Britain and France. And basically, it was, it was known. People knew that it existed. But what people did not know is that there was a whole bunch of secret clauses. And basically, what Britain said was that if Germany attacked, then Britain would go to war. In 1914, that wasn't actually that popular an idea. In, uh, um, uh, you know, we're told that it was, you know, people were on the streets... Um, you know, celebrating the start of the war, and that certainly happened. But there were a lot of other people who were absolutely very much against it. And a a number of cabinet members actually resigned from the cabinet. They didn't want to go to war. But those who did want to go to war, they obviously had the numbers and they, they got what they wanted. I think Britain would have had to go to war anyway, and Britain means Australia, Canada, all the dominions, Um, because in the end, one of Britain's policies up until the 1960s was that any major power in Europe had to be opposed, and anyone who tried to unify Europe had to be opposed. And the reason was that if you controlled Europe, then you were the biggest threat to Britain. And if you were, you know, all the countries were divided up as they were before 1914, then potentially you're a threat, but only potentially. But once you've gone to that extent of unifying Europe, then, yeah, you're, you're the big enemy and you have to be brought undone. That's why they, they fought so hard against, uh, against France in the 1700s. It's why they fought against Napoleon for 25 years. Uh, and the French Revolution. Uh, It's why they fought against Germany in the First World War, and it's why they fought against Hitler and Nazi Germany, because anyone who controls Europe is likely powerful enough to take over Britain. That's how the First World War started, because Germany set in train a series of circumstances that didn't have to exist. Germany could have fought alongside Austria-Hungary against Russia. But there was no plan for that. There was one plan, exactly one plan. Invade France, including through Luxembourg and Belgium. A plan that was guaranteed to make the war much, much bigger, into a world war. So actually, I think that the argument that Germany was primarily responsible for World War I is a very good one. Now, when you talk about the Second World War, many people say, well, you know, Germany had been pretty hard done by in 1919. You know, it, only, it was only allowed to have a 100,000 man army. Um, wasn't allowed to have any reserves. Wasn't allowed to have any U-boats. Its navy was capped at 4,000 men. Its officers were capped at 4,000. Um, it wasn't allowed to have an air force. Wasn't allowed to have tanks it's in a pretty vulnerable position. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Up to a point. Germany wasn't completely defenceless, although it did have a lot of, uh, of restrictions placed upon it, and that would have made it hard if it was going to fight against a, 
a competent enemy. But who was really competent in the interwar period around Germany? Well, actually, as it turns out, not as many people as everyone thought. And once the immediate period after the First World War had calmed down, um, Germany didn't really have any security threats. Germany was pretty peaceful, and its neighbours were peaceable as well. It didn't have any threat from an external thought force. And the only army that was really capable of, even in theory, invading Germany was France. Um, and even with 500,000 men, which is what its uh, army was in 1914, its, its full-time army, uh, it would have had a hard time holding off France if France had been as competent as everyone had thought, including the French. Germany, of course, had to pay reparations to the Allies. Many people say that that was a great burden on Germany, although I must say that Germany did not pay the reparations that it was supposed to pay. It actually got out of paying them. Um, and in f <laughs> to tell you how bad that was, in, 19, in the 1940s, when a new treaty was signed ending the Second World War, uh, I think actually I think it was the early 50s, um, Germany was required to pay the reparations from the First World War that it had not paid. So Germany, actually that's all paid now, but it, it was, uh, you know, people complain, oh, in the 20s and the 30s they had to pay all these reparations. Yeah, they didn't pay as much as they, they said they were going to, that they agreed to. And remember, Germany did agree to the Treaty of Versailles. That's a very important thing. They actually agreed to it. And uh, the other great th thing is the territorial claims. Um, when Germany lost, Germany lost a lot of territory. It lost Elise uh, Lorraine. And uh, people are in, you know, pro German say, oh, you know, it should be German, and pro French say it should be French. And it's a very interesting region because ethnically the people there are Germans, they speak German. But culturally, they're French. And um, what's interesting is that they've never been asked whether they wanted to be part of Germany or France. And I mean, never, even up to today, they've never been asked. Um, whoever's been stronger has controlled that territory. And that's how it's been for, what, 250, 300 years. And I suspect that that's how it will be in the future as well. Um, but then in the east, there's territories that were, were taken off Germany. And, um, you know, in the east, things are a lot more confusing. Today, the populations of Eastern Europe are fairly homogenous. So in Poland, practically everyone's Polish. In Hungary, practically everyone's Hungary and, and so forth. Uh, that wasn't true in 1939. In 1939, there were Germans living all over the place. And that's true of other ethnic, ethnic groups as well. You know, there was no Jewish homeland, for example. They, they were spread out all over the place. You know, in some places they were very strong, in other places very weak. All of these groups, the Germans, were exactly the same. So the provinces that were taken from Germany and given it to Poland, there was actually a good argument that they really were part of Poland. There was a good argument that they were part of Germany. The problem was that the populations were, were so mixed up that it was hard without forcibly moving people to actually determine who was really in control or who should be in control of those territories. And again, people weren't asked. People were just told. And then, of course, you have the, uh, the Ruhr, which the Rhineland, where um, even though it remained part of Germany, it was occupied by France uh, after the war. And, and in fact, uh, an Australian unit was there, um, one of the... Air Force squadrons, I think it was number three squadron um, of the Australian Flying Corps. It was the only Australian unit to serve in occupation duties in uh, in Germany after World War One. But um, but the thing that the Germans objected to was that it was demilitarized, meaning that there was this buffer zone between Germany proper and France 
which where the Germans weren't allowed to base military units. Now, these were problems that continue to arise in post-war Germany, post-World War I Germany, in the Weimar Republic. But the Weimar Republic was not interested in, in dealing with those issues. They were fringe ideas. And while most people may have been eager to have, to have solved them, the political classes were not. They were not interested in them at all. And in fact, uh, in 1925, France and Germany signed a treaty called the Locarno Treaty, which solidified the border, which said this is the border of Germany and France for all time. And in fact, today, that is the border. But as a general rule, the border, the question of borders was not dealt with. And then 1933, Hitler comes to power. Now, many people say, well, Hitler was the reason for World War One. our correction, for World War Two. You know, he was the one who, uh, who unleashed the genie in the bottle. But I'd like to put in an idea that of the seven most powerful countries on earth in between the two world wars, only two of them were actually interested in maintaining the international order. So the seven most powerful countries are Britain, France, Germany, Italy, the Soviet Union, Japan, and the United States. So Britain and France, they're, they're at the top of the heap. They want to keep the world pretty much as it is, right? Maybe trim around the edges, but pretty much as it is. But Germany doesn't want that. Italy doesn't want that. The Soviet Union doesn't want that. And Japan doesn't want that. What they all want is they want to overturn the international order. They all want to create their own empires of one sort or another. And, you know, we now think, we don't think of Italy as a great power. Actually, for most of the Cold War, Italy had about the same economic power as the entire Soviet Union. Italy is actually much more powerful than people think. The problem with Italy is that half of Italy is Germany and half of Italy is Greece. And the two don't mix very well. And uh, Italy is, uh, is, is a bit of a basket case because of that. But in some ways, a very well-run basket case. You know, Ferraris come from Italy. You know, when you think of Italian design you actually think of high quality. That's a, a bit of a contradiction, but there it is. But Germany also has, has this issue. Germany, Germany doesn't want, it feels it's restricted in, in where it is. And that's one of the reasons why the Nazis get so much support. It's not simply that they, they feel that they, they, they tried in the First World War and they'd been cheated. And now in the Second World War, they can actually achieve the national destiny that they felt that they deserved. And Japan felt exactly the same way, that it had been on the winning side in World War I and what had it got for it? It, it hadn't got very much at all. And um, it, it really turned against the Western allies and uh, it was also on its own collision course and of course, you know, the Soviet Union is a revolutionary state. Of course, it doesn't want to maintain the current world system. It wants to overthrow it. And then we have the, the outlier, the United States. And the United States is asleep. It, it, it acts like it's Bulgaria. It has an army smaller than Bulgaria's. It, it's, uh, it believes that its navy is the only serious defense that it needs that it's so far away from everything that it doesn't have to worry about it. But the big issue wasn't aircraft, as most people would think. The big issue is business. The United States gave up being an isolationist power, whether it meant to or not, in the 1880s when it became a major trading country. And once it decided that it was going to be involved in massive international trade, then it was part of the world system. It wasn't some sleepy 
little country that no one had to worry about. And this is another thing that people forget about the United States is the United States used to, when it became independent, it had, what, 3 million people. And now it's got 330 million. You know, so it's gone through a lot of stages. And some of those stages were pretty piddly. But by 1939, that wasn't true. It wasn't piddly. It was a massive world power, biggest industrial country in the world, and with massive military potential, but it pretended that it didn't have any of those things. It actively pretended, you know. It, it wasn't simply that it was asleep. It, that it, was, it, it took sleeping tablets to make sure that it was asleep, that it could ignore the rest of the world. And that, that ended in, at Pearl Harbor. And if they had been on side with Britain and France, those three countries could have controlled the world. After 1919, they could have controlled everything in the world. And if they had been willing to back each other up, there wouldn't have, wouldn't have been any World War II because you, you just couldn't beat that power. You know, Even if the Americans only supplied money and industrial might and Britain and France provided the manpower, you still couldn't beat them. But because they were divided... That allowed the world war to take place. Now, one of the everyone knows the war started first of September, nineteen thirty-nine. Germany invades Poland, and there's a whole run-up, a whole series of events that happens. And people say, well, on the, <laughs> some people say, well, you know, we shouldn't have gone to war over Poland. After all, we didn't help Poland. But actually, in 1945, Poland came back into existence. And if we had not gone to war, Poland today would not exist. And quite frankly, maybe the Poles themselves wouldn't exist. You know, white people who Hitler was supposed to love. But the Allies made a massive mistake. They should not have gone to war in 1939. They should have gone to war in 1935, in March 1935, when the German government announced that it was repudiating the Treaty of Versailles. Now, if Germany wanted to change the Treaty of Versailles, then it should have said to the British and French, hey, we want to change the Treaty of Versailles. We want to renegotiate it. And actually, I think they would have had, they would have done well out of that. But that wasn't the purpose. And this is when Nazi Germany proved that it couldn't be trusted. And every year after that, it did something else to prove that it couldn't be trusted. Which is why the Allies fought until unconditional surrender was achieved. Because, as I said, they could have renegotiated, but they didn't. Instead, they just repudiated. They just tore it up. They just said, hey, this massive international agreement, one of the most famous agreements in world history, let's face it, we all know it. Right? We all know it by name. That's how famous it is. 15 years after it was signed, we're going to tear it up and completely ignore it. If the Allies had gone to war in 1935 against Germany, then there were no U-boats. Germany had zero U-boats. There was no Dorniers, Heinkels, Mischerschmitts, no aircraft at all. Germany did not have an air force. It had gliders. It didn't have an air force. No Panzers. But instead... We waited around, thumb in bum, mind in neutral, until Germany was fully rearmed. You know, like, like it has to be a fair fight. War doesn't have to be a fair fight, right? We should have taken out Germany in 1935. And it doesn't have anything to do with Nazism, whether there was a Nazi government or not. Any country that had signed an international agreement should stick to it. And if it doesn't like it, then it should renegotiate it. That's how the international order should work. Not every man for himself. 
and World War II was about Germany deciding that it didn't want to play by the rules, that it wanted to make its own rules. Well, you have to pay for that. That's not free. And Germany did pay for it. We did fight them. We defeated them. We occupied them. And actually, I'm totally in agreement with that. That's exactly what should have happened. Now, I'm 45 minutes into a half an hour talk. Uh, I hope you've found this of interest. I have. I will leave it there and I will speak to you next week. Look after yourself. Bye-bye.